Okay, this is a short video that I just wanted to make on oxygen delivery and the different types of devices that are available to us to get oxygen to the patient. So we're going to start with the variable flow devices and by that I mean nasal cannulae and the simple face mask. Move that out of the way for now. So with the simple face mask, all you need to do is connect it to the oxygen tubing. So we can do this. This is a, a nebulization device, there, but you can connect that to here. So you can connect that over, thank you. So that's how you can open them up to put some, say, salbutamol or combivent in there. And then they screw together, connect, and then to the very bottom of it here is where your oxygen tubing connects. Just like that. And that will nebulize the patient and give them oxygen. For the simple nasal cannula, they're very simple as well. So these are just going into the patient's nose and connecting directly to oxygen. So into the patient's nose, around their ears, and you connect this end to the oxygen flow device. So your flow meters on the wall or on an oxygen tank, which I'll show you in a few moments. So there are your two variable flow devices. And the reason they're variable flow is that you can't control exactly the FiO2 that the patient is getting. For the nasal cannula, you can run anything from 0.5 up to about four liters through the cannula. The oxygen you're giving is not humidified and not warmed. So if we give higher flow rates than that, it can cause drying of the mucous membranes, which long-term can cause them to split and become quite sore. It can also be just generally uncomfortable for the patient to have cold uh, oxygen blown into their um, nasal ca uh, cavities. For the simple face mask, you're dialing up however many liters. You can dial up to 15 liters on these, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving 15 liters to the patient or a defined FiO2 to the patient because this hole here is just a hole. It's not a valve. The patient, as they breathe in and out, will be breathing a variable amount of oxygen coming through the mask and air being pulled in from the surrounding environment. So there are two variable flow devices. We're going to move on now to our fixed flow devices, starting with our Venturis. So these are the devices that make a mask a Venturi mask. There are a number of different types, all coloured differently, that give a different percentage of oxygen. Starting down here at the blue, 24%. And in order to do that, you have to put two litres through the mask. So we're going to connect it up to the mask here and show you how to do that. So we disconnect it from our device. So 28%, we connect simple oxygen tubing to it. The other end connects to the flow meter on the wall and the flow meter on the wall must be set at two liters in order to deliver 24% to the patient. And it is this interconnecting device that determines the percentage of oxygen within the face mask. So there are different colors Moving up to 28%, you must give four liters. Then 35%, you must give, I think it's eight liters through that. It's a little harder to see. So 35% oxygen and eight, eight liters. liters per minute. A 40%, which you probably see most commonly on the ward. So that's 10 liters per minute and all the way up to 60%, which is 15 liters per minute. 15 liters per minute is the max that you can get out of a flow meter that's on the walls of the hospital. So that's our variable flow. The other way to give, um, or excuse me, fixed flow, the other way to give fixed flow is through high flow nasal oxygen. So you'll see lots of different names for this. You'll hear OptiFlow and Thrive and these kind of trade names, but all it really means, you can see on this image here, is that you're giving nasal oxygen to someone, but through this um, down the side here, there's going to be warmed and humidified oxygen from the high flow nasal cannula uh, device. I'll show you that in a separate video up in the intensive care unit. So the difference between this and your regular nasal cannula is that this is warmed up to 37 degrees and humidified to a high humidity. So we can give flows of oxygen or flows of gas up to 60 or even 70 litres per minute through this and we can adjust the oxygen concentration. 
There are some devices that don't allow you to adjust the oxygen concentration, but that's due to the separate machine that this is connected to rather than anything got to do with the nasal cannula themselves. So that's how they look and they're strapped around the patient. Make sure they're actually in the patient's nose. They're half the time they're falling out or maybe one is in a nostril and one is elsewhere. So make sure they're in the patient's nose. This does two things. It delivers an FiO2 to the patient greater than they would be getting if they were on room air, but it delivers high, high flows that help prop the air open and give a few centimeters of CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, up at the higher flows. So you can see on the side of this, it says that we can um, run at flows here from 10 to 60 liters. As we get up to the 40, 50, 60 litre per minute range, it starts to help prop the patient's airway open because it's blowing into it so forcefully. This is difficult to measure and we can't say exactly how many centimetres of CPAP they're giving, but we do often use these in patients to try and provide that little bit of extra support to them. Just to show you what they look like here when I turn it over. So these are the nasal cannulas. So it's the part that goes into the nose. And through this white tubing here, this is connected to the actual high flow nasal oxygen device. And that's what delivers the warmed um, humidified gas. So that's our fixed performance devices. And then we move on to our final two, which are reservoir devices. Firstly, the one that you'll see quite regularly on the wards if you have a patient who's quite ill. And this appears to be a simple face mask again, when we attach the oxygen on here. But the difference is this is that we have a valve. So this allows or tries to prevent, if you compare the two, you can see the valve there. This means that each time the patient breathes in, if we have this bag full of oxygen, so once we've attached our oxygen on here, open up this bag and let it fill full of oxygen so that each time they breathe in, they're breathing in from the bag and from the mask. So a big inhale of close to 100% oxygen. As they breathe out, there's a valve in here that stops it going back into the bag because we don't want them re-breathing uh, CO2 or any lower levels of oxygen. As they breathe out, it comes out through here. And of course, a little bit around the side of the mask. So this allows us to set a higher FiO2 and get close to 100% uh, using this mask. How well it's fitted on the patient will determine exactly what FiO2 they get. So we can see the difference there between your simple face mask and your reservoir bag or a non-rebreather bag as it's often called because we don't want any rebreathing of CO2. So that's one reservoir, devi reservoir device. And then finally we move on to a C circuit. So this is letter C and the reason it's called C is that there are a number of circuits that look just like this that are called Mapleson circuits and this is Mapleson type C. There are a number of different types but this is the one that you will see on the wards and down in the emergency departments. The, di the difference between the different Mapleson A and B and whatnot you don't particularly need to know but what it mainly is is the difference between the location of this valve to the bag to where the oxygen is coming in. Okay. So this is a big reservoir bag for adults. They're typically two liters. You can see two liter bag, reservoir bag here that we uh, connect to oxygen. So this end is what's connected into your regular flow meter on the side of the wall. This is a valve that increases the pressure you're applying to the patient. And this is an expiratory valve. So as they breathe out, it comes out through here. Yet again, you don't want them inhaling any expired CO2 inhale from here and as they breathe out it comes out through the expiratory valve so if you see these in action they do make quite a bit of noise sometimes as they exhale so Ula's just going to show you how we put them together so they come with a mask like this a lovely soft mask that if it's not inflated enough that you need to inflate it a little bit more with a regular syringe through this device here this one's probably okay or maybe a little bit more we then put an angle piece onto it that just makes it a little easier for us to use and then we attach a filter. So this filter is a viral and bacterial filter, particularly in patient coughing and whatnot. So we put that on. And if someone's having their end tidal carbon dioxide measured or any gas measured, and then it comes through here, there's a little pipe that connects on there. But most of the time that doesn't need to be open. You do, however, if it's not being used, need to make sure that that is completely closed. Otherwise you're going to have a lot of leaking through it. Now, so we connect our mask and our filter 
together here. We can actually take out this angled piece that we'll just to make it a little more straighter. There we go. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a nice straight line between your bag, your valve, your filter and your mask. And if the patient was here, if I was standing at the head of the patient, then this would be over their nose, this would be over their edge of their mouth, and this would be uh, just on their chin, ideally not off their chin. You're looking to get a good seal around it so that each time they breathe in, you're breathing from your reservoir bag and not largely from the air around you. So if you get called to an emergency, you might often see us in anaesthetics or ICU coming down and using these bags to initially help ventilate someone. You can ventilate someone like this when they're not breathing at all by getting a good seal with the mask, closing off the valve and pressing this bag when it's full of oxygen to help push oxygen and air into them. And again, they exhale out through this valve here. So there are our reservoir devices. I'm going to move on then and just show you, show you some airway adjunct devices that you may see again in emergencies or down in the operating room if you come down to see us. Starting with adjuncts, this is an oropharyngeal airway. So I'm going to show you how to use this, not by putting it into someone, but just by showing it on the side of the face. So I'm going to show it here on the lap. So if this went in, this is how it goes in. So it goes in over the tongue. We often turn it upside down to get behind the back of the tongue and then it sits in the airway like this. So on the left hand side, it helps hold the tongue forward so that any air we pass through can either go through the device or around the device and keep the tongue out of the way. There are lots of different sizes of these depending on the size of the patient and we size them up um, from the angle of the jaw there as you saw to the angle of the mouth. So there are a number of different sizes if you can see them in their packets here, moving from quite large down to teeny, teeny, tiny ones for very small little babies, finger for scale there. So that's oropharyngeal airways because they go into the mouth and down into the pharynx. I then have two different examples of nasopharyngeal airways. So this, as you may have guessed, goes from the nose and down through the nose into the back of the pharynx. The purpose of this is to um, help keep the airway open and a slightly more alert patient. The oropharyngeal airway, as you can imagine, can be very uncomfortable and cause gagging in a patient who's quite awake. So only for someone who's quite unconscious do we use those, or even under general anaesthetic when we're trying to oxygenate someone before we've put a breathing tube in. So these we use in someone who's a little bit more awake. They can help open the airway and they can also facilitate suctioning. So lots of suction catheters are able to pass down through these. These, uh, again, a little hard to show you. So if you turn to the other side there. So I'm just going to show you that these are go down the side. So turn the other way for me. Uh, that way, that way. There we go, lovely. So these go through the nose and down into the back of the pharynx, just to show you what they look like. There's a pin included in them. This pin is always used to go through the top of the nasopharyngeal airway to stop them going back into the airway. So if you happen to use one that's a bit small for a patient, you don't want to lose it into uh, the airway and have to have it retrieved by the ENT surgeons. They're always lubricated before they're put in and we usually use local anaesthetic of some kind with a vasoconstrictor included to try and stop any bleeding. This is just a different type of nasopharyngeal airway that's a little bit smaller and it has this little extra tubing on it that we can connect to a CO2 monitor for someone who is quite sedated. Okay, so there are airway adjuncts and now moving on to the actual airways themselves. We have two different types here. We have what we call supraglottic airways that sit above the glottis. Remembering the glottis is the space between your vocal cords. And then we have an endotracheal tube which goes into the trachea. Your vocal cords sit here and this is below the trachea or below the vocal cords in the trachea. So these are two different types. This is a classic LMA. So you'll see us using these a lot in theatre and they come in different sizes. This one's a size four and it tells you what size of a patient they're appropriate for roughly and how much air you need to put in them to inflate this lovely squishy cuff here. This cuff sits above the glottis and again I'm going to show you just on the outside of the here. So if this was in Willa's mouth it sits like this above where his larynx is and as we ventilate through it or as he breathes through it um, everything comes in and out through this mask. So it's a mask that sits in the airway. The very tip of it down here is sitting at or just in the top of the esophagus. 
This is not a definitive airway, meaning that if a patient was to regurgitate material, vomit, or if anything was to come up from the stomach during anesthesia, they can inhale some material. This is just a different type of airway, uh, a laryngeal mask airway called an eye gel. It's a bit more firm and it has this port that comes all the way up the side so that if someone were to vomit under anesthesia, we see material come up here. Thankfully, that's rare. Again, they come in different sizes and show you exactly uh, what size patient to put them into, although it varies a little bit depending on, say, body habitus. Finally, we have the endotracheal tube. The endotracheal tube has a top that connects to our ventilator, so this fits with all our ventilator tubing. It has graduations along in centimetres along the tubing. For most people, it tends to be at the lips or teeth about 19 to 22, depending on how tall the person is, somewhere around here. This is called the pilot tubing. So as you can see, it has a little cuff here, a little spring device that we put a syringe into. And as we inflate this, it inflates our cuff, which is located below the vocal cords. So as we use a laryngoscope, which we'll discuss in a moment, we look in and we see the vocal cords and we pass it through until the vocal cords are sitting between these two black lines. That's usually appropriately sized for most people. And then we inflate this cuff to help hold it in place and to help seal the airway. In this patient, if they were to have any sort of aspiration or regurgitation of material from their stomach, they would not go into their lungs or certainly very little of it. And down at the very bottom here, we have an extra hole in the side of the endotracheal tube, just in case this one down here gets plugged off. We have an extra hole in the side that's called the Murphy's eye. So that's an endotracheal tube. They are put in with a laryngoscope. This is a laryngoscope handle. Okay, there unfortunately are no batteries in this one, but this is where the light comes from. So these are filled with batteries and there's a light that comes out here as soon as you click on a blade. So these attach together. And as soon as you click that on, a light comes out through this little device here and shines directly down into the airway when you're having a look. These blades come in different shapes and sizes. So you can see a few different sizes here. This is a size two, three and four. Um, child, most women and most men and then tall men generally. You have different ones like straight blades, curved blades and various other types that you certainly don't need to know. But that's what they're like blades and a laryngoscope handle. You might get a chance to do a little bit of laryngoscopy when you come down to theatre with us. And then finally, I want to show an oxygen tank. So with your oxygen tanks, this is all your oxygen tubing uh, attaches onto here. And you just set the flow all the way up to it's 15 litres per minute on this. So that's what you use it by the bedside if you don't have a flow meter, which looks like this. So our flow meter is attached directly into the wall Okay, so the hospital oxygen come out through these devices at high pressure, at four bar, which is four times atmospheric pressure. And they come from a big device called a VIE outside, which is a massive tank of oxygen under a vacuum, high pressure and low temperature. So it's liquefied. It could provide thousands and thousands of litres of oxygen to the hospital. In smaller hospitals, it's just a what we call a manifold of cylinders. So it's large versions of these cylinders, very, very large versions in a manifold in a row. So on our flow meters, we can go all the way up to 15 liters of flow. This one doesn't seem to be, it's probably not connected in properly. Oh my gosh. Anyway, they go all the way up to 15 liters of flow. Anything above that is considered high flow. Anything below 15 litres is regular flow oxygen and this little ball will rise depending on how much oxygen you're deciding to uh, give to the patient through the device at the end. So that's a quick run through the different oxygen devices and our different airway devices just as a little bit of an add-on for you. These are the ones that you're mainly going to be using down on the wards and see mostly as interns. If you have any questions feel free to email me and let me know.